Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Come and Reason Sabbath School. We're glad that you folks are here joining us in College Dale, Tennessee, and we're glad that you folks online are joining us. Uh, I am not Dr. Tim Jennings. Uh, my name is Lori Atkins. I'm substituting for Tim. He is out in Dallas, Texas. He is manning the Come and Reason Ministries booth at the Association of Christian Counselors. I think it's their national convention versus their international convention. They alternate years, but they are very strong supporters, lovers of this ministry. All of those folks work in the mental health field, so they, they really understand the importance and the tie-in uh, of the work and the study that Tim's done on the brain and how what we believe impacts our mental health, physical health, and spiritual health. So anyway, let's keep uh, that endeavor in prayer for him out, out there. Um, we're always adding new class members, whether it's online or here. We have some visitors here today for the first time. Um, so I always want to mention our amazing website, comeandreason.com, which is just a, I mean, it's an incredible resource of materials related to this class and, and some of the teachings. We record these classes every Saturday. All those recordings, historical recordings are up there. Um, Tim has given three uh, afternoon seminars at local churches. Those were all recorded. Those have been made into DVDs, and all of those are available on the website. He writes a blog. You're able to get books. The notes from these classes are available on the website in searchable format. Um, so it's a real, a real resource. So we want you to go and visit comeandreason.com. Um, so let's start this morning's class with prayer. Bow your heads. Father God, we are grateful for this opportunity, this place that we can meet, that we can uh, really get to know who you are and let you reveal yourself to us. We ask for your presence today here in this class, and we ask uh, for your presence in, in Texas, that uh, you would be with Tim in the ministry and that folks would be reached and touched with, with this message. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're starting a new quarterly today, which... They were late getting up online, if you actually get your quarterlies from the online resource. Um, but we're going to be studying the book of Job over the next 13 weeks. The story of Job is pretty well known. Even people who are not necessarily familiar with the Bible or Christianity probably know the story of Job. We kind of use him as a benchmark when we're evaluating what other folks are going through. If you see someone experiencing one hardship or trial after another, we equate them to Job. Or if we see somebody who's particularly long-suffering or patient, we say they have the patience of Job. What comes to your mind when you think of Job, the man or his story? What do you think of? How faithful he was. I mean, he was faithful to God regardless of what happened to him. Right. Before and after. Mm -hmm. Before, during, and after. What else? Questioning God isn't necessarily wrong. Mm -hmm. That you can question, you can feel concerned, you can express everything you think to God, and God will respond. But I notice in God's response, He never does say that Satan did all this. Correct. That's the thing that really surprised me about His response. Obviously, we know because the book is written showing us yes. that Satan did that. But at the time this story was happening, when God finally did respond to Job, He did not blame Satan for it. Right. Or anything. He just said, you know, this is who I am. Get to know me. Right. And I do think, I actually think that the questioning and the wrestling is critical. I don't, and even the quarterly, we'll talk about this if we have time. The quarterly surprised me with coming out that this is part of what began or was the catalyst for the change in Job because his heart was still changed, his character was still grown and matured during the suffering and some of that came from the questioning of God. Teresa. I kind of think of the end times because <clears throat> Job went through so many trials. He lost his family. Mm -hmm. He lost all of his riches. He lost everything. everything. And he's stuck by God and I know that that's what we will be facing. But in the end, God showed his glory. Yeah. Joe back an abundance more than he ever had before. That. Right. So I think it's kind of a testimony to us to know that we just have to hold on. No matter what we go through, we have to hold on, we have to have faith, and we have to cling to Jesus. Nice. 
So, this has always been kind of a tough book in the Bible for me. Not sure if I'm the only one. Some actually think that the book is fiction, or it's a parable similar to the Good Samaritan. And even the chronology of when the book was written and when it took place versus where it's placed in the sequence of books in the Old Testament, that's even weird to me. So, but there is significant evidence that Job actually lived somewhere between 1710 and 1500 before Christ. And archaeology has shown that all the geographical and historical details in the book are accurate and reliable. The book of Job is the only one written in the old Hebrew language among all the biblical scrolls that were found besides the book of Moses books of Moses. So it was written in the same language as the books of Moses, and Moses is believed to be the author of the book of Job. But I think without the great controversy perspective that I have now, I completely understand how easy it might be to misunderstand or misconstrue what goes on in the book of Job. So in fact, I found a very interesting commentary. It was titled, Is the Book of Job a Parody? And the title intrigued me. So listen to what this author says. Sometimes I really do not like certain chapters of the Bible. Two of the worst chapters for me have always been Job 1 and 2. They tell the story of a good and righteous man who became the pawn in a little game of Russian roulette between God and Satan. Job is the unwitting butt of a cosmic wager. While I do not believe that good and righteous people who love God will always have life, or have a life that turns out peachy keen, I nevertheless have a big problem with a God who uses humans the way God uses Job in these two chapters. This is divine entrapment. What would you think of a parent who conspired with a drug dealer to try to sell drugs to their children and threaten them with killing their parents or their siblings just to see if the child will say no to drugs? What kind of a sick parent does that? What would you think of a husband who conspired with a friend to try to seduce his wife just to see if she really loves him? What kind of a husband would do this? Yet this is what the story of, this is what God and Satan conspire to do with Job. I'm sorry, I really do not like these chapters of the Bible. He concludes that if one reads the prologue of Job without awareness of the author's, the author's intent to argue against a perennial but perverse notion of God, the picture that emerges is precisely the one the author attempted to disprove. In other words, Job 1 and 2 is actually a parody of the recurrent, persistent, false view of God. It shows a forgetful God, a power-hungry God, a God who is so desirous of proving himself right that he plays around with human lives, which mean nothing to him just to make a point. The author of the book of Job is making fun of this popular and pervasive but perverted view of God in order to show us that our God, the God of the Bible, is not like this at all. Thoughts about that? Well, God only usually gives you what you can handle, and most people probably couldn't handle what he went through, so he's probably above most people's, you know, he tolerated more than most people can handle. But and it's interesting, God knew what he could tolerate. Well, also, God knows the end from the beginning. <clears throat> right. So he knew what Job was going to do. Yes. Well, Satan has a great accuser. I'm sure Satan did not leave it alone until God had to step back and show Satan that there is somebody who truly loves him. I right. It was about what that author thought it was about. Yeah, we're going to talk about what was leading up to that. And so what insight does our great controversy perspective give us, perspective give us into evaluating Job's backstory? I found a quote from the Book of Education, gives us some insight. Unselfishness. The very principle of God's kingdom is the principle that Satan hates. Its very existence he denies. From the beginning of the great controversy, he has endeavored to prove God's principles of action to be selfish, and he deals in the same way with all who serve God. To disprove Satan's claim is the work of Christ and all of all who bear his name. That's us. 
It was to give in his own life an illustration of unselfishness that Jesus came in the form of humanity. And all who accept this principle are to be workers together with him in demonstrating it in practical life. To choose the right because it is right, to stand for truth at the cost of suffering and sacrifice, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. She's quoting Isaiah there. Very early in the history of the world is given the life record of one over whom this controversy of Satan's was waged. So Job's life is the record of Satan's controversy, of Satan's accusations against God. Of Job, the patriarch of Uz, the testimony of the searcher of hearts was, there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, fears God, eschews evil. Against this man, Satan brought scornful charge. Does Job fear God for nothing? Hast thou not made a hedge about him, about his house, about all that he has on every side? Put forth your hand now, touch all that he has, touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said unto Satan, All that he has is in your power. Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. Thus permitted, Satan swept away all that Job possessed, flocks and herds, men servants and maidservants, sons and daughters, and he smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. Still another element of bitterness was added to Job's cup. His friends... Seeing in adversity but the retribution of sin, God's retributive justice, pressed on his bruised and burdened spirit their accusations of wrongdoing, seemingly forsaken of heaven and earth, yet holding fast his faith in God and his consciousness of integrity, in anguish and perplexity, he cried, My soul is weary of my life. According to his faith, so it was unto Job. When he hath tried me, he said, I shall come forth as gold. And so it happened. By his patient endurance, he vindicated his own character and thus the character of him whose representative he was. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning. For those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, the Bible biography has a yet higher lesson in the ministry of sorrow. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Witnesses that he is good and that his goodness is supreme. We are made a theater unto the world, both to angels and to men. Have you ever thought when going through a trial that there was a higher lesson in your ministry of sorrow? So who is accused? Who's on trial? I believe Satan's accusation was against God much more than it was against Job. I don't like how she <clears throat> gives ownership of a controversy to Satan. She says Satan's controversy. That's right. How many of us have been in relationships where the other party creates a controversy out of nothing, just manufactures it? Okay, anybody? Am I the only one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, correct. Um, and this is a controversy that could be completely 100% of it, but for the other party. Okay, this is this is what this is why we're here. That's right. The, the controversy is is Satan has ownership of it. Certain allegations were made about God and His character that He had to set forth evidence to disprove. And here we are, what, 6,000 years later, still, still weighing out the evidence? Yes. One of the problems with Job is that we use it as a reference for other people to explain things. Sometimes we use the very words of the friends who God yes. and Job says, what they said about me is not is right. wrong. And yet we don't go to the end and say, well, we shouldn't pay attention to what these people say. That's right. They're saying the wrong thing. We actually use their verses to talk what they've said as right. something that's true about God. I think that's true. So Paul tells us Romans 3, 4, God is the one on trial. God is the one who's accused. And God is the one who will be proved innocent. And he says, God, may you be proved right and true in the hearts and minds of your intelligent creatures when you present yourself openly for their judgment. So yeah, this is what's playing in the men and angels theater. 
By his patient endurance, he vindicated his own character and thus the character of him whose representative he was. That's why we're here. So those of you who studied your lesson found out that they started at the end. The lesson title is The End. And uh, although it's the first lesson in the quarterly, they're focusing on the end of Job's story. They talk about the importance and significance of a happy ending. We're taught the importance of a good ending in writing classes. We see it in fiction. We see it in nonfiction. We see it in TV shows. We see it in movies, scripts. The writers have to have satisfactory closure. They want to tie up all the loose ends with the characters and the storylines. Even in speeches, presentations, good, clear conclusion is critical. So what about in real life? What about in our own stories that are hardly ever as neat and tidy? The quarterly asks, quote, how could our stories end well when they always end in death? In that sense, we never really have happy endings, do we? Because when is death ever happy? I've actually seen quite a number of happy deaths <laughs> as a nurse. I have this seen, was, I've seen ones where to live would be... Absolutely. I agree. I had down uh, those that think death is never happy have not lived long enough <laughs> because there are times when death is a merciful mm -hmm. reaction and is not the worst thing that could happen for sure. So yeah, a couple of us thought that there was a bit of a recurring dart theme in this week's lesson having to do with constant death. Well, the whole concept of death itself is merciful. Correct. Uh, it, I mean, imagine if um, the antediluvians were still around. They think about how deeply the, sinful the world would be. I, frankly, I think the human species would be extinct. Right. There's a couple of people, had they lived, would yeah. have probably succeeded. Um, so anyway, we're going to try to stay on the bright side. Oh, sorry. Yes, Sunny. Sometimes death is such a shocking thing that it wakes people up. Absolutely. Surrounded by that death. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the people that are left that can use that for something constructive. So like I said, we're going to skip around a little bit in order to try to stay on the bright side since, of course, we believe this first death of sleep is not, in fact, the end of our stories and can be a happy ending. So Sunday's lesson, what is the standard fairy tale ending? Most children's stories, practically ever, every fairy tale ends with happily ever after. And they lived happily ever after. That's right. The quarterly says it's almost a cliche. I'm saying it's a full-blown cliche. Cliched ending where the handsome prince rescues the damsel in distress, the hero triumphs over the villain. <clears throat> now our lesson suggests that this is how the book of Job ends, at least at first glance. The hero and his new wife triumph in the end, or at least end up on a relatively positive note. But is that only part of the story? Let's look at the final verses of the book to see how Job's story ends. After Job had interceded for his friends, we may get to talk more about that later, God restored his fortune and then doubled it. All his brothers and sisters and friends came to the house and celebrated. They told him how sorry they were and consoled him for all the trouble God had brought him. <laughs> Each of them brought generous housewarming gifts. God blessed Job's later life even more than his earlier life. He ended up with 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 teams of oxen, 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven more sons and three daughters. There was not a woman in that country as beautiful as Job's daughters. Their father treated them as equals with their brothers, providing the same inheritance, which was unheard of and is significant to have been recorded here. Job lived on another 140 years, living to see his children and grandchildren, four generations of them. Then he died an old man with a full life. When you think about it, if all his first children that died and he prayed for are... Uh, make it to heaven, then, and, and all the new ones do too, then he'll have double the amount of children. Interesting. And some stories to tell about how they had brothers and sisters that they didn't know about. Uh, yeah, so on paper, the numbers look really good. 
He ends up with twice as much material wealth, seven new sons, and three new, apparently super attractive daughters uh, to replace those that he lost. Job's uh, health was apparently healed. He was restored to health such that he lived another 140 years. So it sounds like he was in a relatively good place, happy place by the end of his life. But what about the scars? I'm guessing literal and figurative scars that lingered on throughout his life. Tuesday's lesson takes a look into the rest of that story. So we're going to skip right over Monday and go to Tuesday. Tuesday's lesson is called the partial restoration. We know on paper, Job ends up better off than before Satan targeted him. God restored all that the locusts had eaten. But does full healing and restoration mean there is no memory? There's no pain. There are no scars. <clears throat> Have any of you ever had surgery? Even if you are completely healed, maybe you're even healthier than you were before surgery. Won't you still carry physical scars of that procedure for the rest of your life? So based on the fact that he was near death, covered with boils and sores and such, from the soles of his feet to the top of his head, can you imagine... It seems reasonable to think that he may have experienced ongoing health issues and carried physical scars for the rest of those 140 years. True? I cannot begin to imagine the pain of losing a child. Some of you in this room or some of you listening may have experienced this unfathomable loss. But can you imagine what it's like to lose 10 children at once. So I'm sure while Job was overjoyed and blessed with 10 new children, kids are not interchangeable. No. They're not replaceable. So I'm quite sure that he still mourned and missed those lost children throughout the rest of his life. So even in God's complete comfort, healing, and restoration, there can still be painful memories. There can be mourning of loss, physical and emotional scars. But I can also imagine that, can't you imagine that Job became extremely sensitive and empathetic with other people who were going through tragedy and loss and illness? I saw a quote this week. It said, God does not comfort us to make us comfortable. God comforts us to, makes us to make us comfort able. So that we are in a position able to comfort others because of what we have experienced. Do you not find that to be true? In your life, in your, in your times of struggle or pain? Based on what I've learned in the last couple of months, I now would maybe tie it back to quantum entanglement or string theory that when we are in those vulnerable positions of tragedy and sorrow and pain, we are operating on the same vibration or the same wavelength as other people who are experiencing that. And I think that those, those energies attract and that we're, it's happened to me. That's all I can say is that it just makes, maybe it's because most of the time we're not open and vulnerable. Most of the time we're kind of closed off. And when that rawness comes out, it attracts other people that are, are in need of that. So the quarterly points out another reason Job's restoration was only partial is because for the most part, the reasons that held all the tragedies that befell him remained a mystery. We don't have any evidence that he fully knew the backstory of why everything that happened to him happened to him. Well, that's what it's like for most of us. We live on a planet that is literally groaning under the weight of sin. So we will all likely have a stack of questions that remain unanswered this side of eternity. Or sometimes that is the answer. We live on a planet that is groaning under the weight of sin. So 
So in this world, we're promised to have trouble. And to me, this is all related to that deeply ingrained idea, and I mean down to the DNA level, that there has to be a reason for tragedy, for illness, for the defects that we encounter down here on this earth. The disciples asked Jesus, who sinned that this man was born blind? They believed it had to be. That's why he was stricken. Job's friends were absolutely convinced that Job had done something awful, had some hidden, unconfessed sin that caused him to be retributively punished and admonished by God. I have always been so impressed that Job never thought that was the reason, even after all of the events that befell him. He knew it wasn't. He understood God's character and God's methods and the way he governs his universe well enough that he could not be convinced of it either by his friends or his wife. We really have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds in order to drop this notion that God's goodness or his character of love is defined or described by our earthly circumstances. Perceived blessings or lack of blessings, God is love, God is good, period. God is always focused on changing us, changing our hearts and minds, and sometimes he changes our circumstances, but not always. So based on how God described Job to Satan, like you said, he knows the end from the beginning. He was 100% confident of how Job would react and respond to Satan's attacks. What does that tell us about God's ability to judge or his ability to diagnose accurately our characters? So when he says, let the wicked be wicked still, let the righteous be righteous still, he's making a judgment, but he's not making it so. He's making an accurate diagnosis because he knows our hearts. He knows our characters. It's an important distinction here that uh, that uh, God the Father and Michael the Archangel uh, and the Holy Spirit all knew the end from the beginning. Right. The, the unfallen angels didn't. And frankly, I think Lucifer himself literally thought that if he brought enough trouble on Job, he would be proved right. Oh, guaranteed. He was disillusioned enough to think that. So Lucifer knew without a doubt that he, that if given enough leeway, he would win. We are going to talk about that right now. Um, I wanted to read you the short, okay, I'm going to mess Dean up. Go to camera two, Dean. So I'm going to read the quick story of Job from Tim's book, The Journal of the Watcher. Like I said, we always have new people. So if you haven't seen this, this is a book that Tim wrote and is incredibly illustrated. Um, it's, it's a smartphone app that you can get on your phone or your smart device, or it's a beautiful, glossy, illustrated book that you can buy on Amazon. Anyway, it tells the story of the great controversy from beginning to end from the perspective of a heavenly watcher, which they're watching the theater. They went to the theater and they're watching what goes on here or on earth. So he, Job gets a spot in the journal of the watcher. And it says, remember, this is just following the flood. Remember, the avenue for the Messiah, through which the Messiah could come, had been narrowed down to one person that was still open to listening to God. And eight of them got on the ark. So the book of Job took place relatively soon after the flood. So it was still a very small number of people who were open to God's leading, which is what gave Satan the confidence to say he pretty much owned the earth. So, right after the flood, while God continued to protect his faithful few and prevent Satan from eradicating them from the earth, Satan saw an opportunity to misrepresent God before the intelligences in heaven and gain access to those still loyal to God. The representative heads of all creation were gathering together in heaven, and Satan thought 
if I can twist God's actions and misrepresent his motives, then maybe I can win more sinless beings over to my cause. Satan reasoned that if he were subtle enough, maybe some of God's loyal sons would fail to realize that God put many of his earthly children to rest in order to keep an avenue open to heal and redeem. Maybe he could deceive them into believing God was abusive and coercive and could not be trusted. And maybe he could simultaneously corner God into giving him access to destroy those few remaining humans loyal to him on the earth. So Satan went to this meeting in heaven, <clears throat> claiming to be the rightful representative of the earth. But God was not fooled by Satan's trickery and immediately turned the tables on the evil one. Even though the devil claimed that the earth was his, God announced to the heavenly gathering that there was a man from us who rejected Satan's methods of unselfishness and who was loyal to God, loving others more than self. Remember what we read earlier, unselfishness, the very principle of God's kingdom is the principle that Satan hates the most and even denies its very existence. Therefore, all the earth was not Satan's. All of its inhabitants did not recognize Satan as their leader. But Satan countered God's claim by asserting that God was now lying and that this man only pretended to be loyal because God bribed him with riches and power. The sons of God were confused. They couldn't read the secret motives of Satan's heart. If they could, none of the angels would ever have been deceived by Satan in the first place. Satan thought, if I can get Job to curse God... I can look to all the intelligent beings in the universe and say, see, God was wrong about Job. He's wrong about me too. You can't trust what God says. So this was Satan's motivation. However, God did know Job. So before this great gathering of heavenly beings, he said to Satan, Job is in your hands. Do whatever you like, but you must not kill him. So while Satan was free to bless Job with more wealth, he did what he always does. He began destroying and killing, revealing that he, and not God, is the true source of disease, pain, suffering, and death. Job, though assaulted by Satan's fiercest attacks, revealed the truth about God, demonstrating that God was right and Satan was wrong. God can be trusted. Satan is the destroyer, not God. Satan was bitter that his plot was foiled. So this great controversy, this war that's going on, it is not about us. Obviously, Job started out with a very strong character. God picked him out of everyone who was alive on the planet. But even his character continued to be refined continued to grow and mature through his suffering and through his questioning of God, like Lynn talked about earlier. He actually experienced God and got to know him more intimately during this time of trial and sorrow. This is the experience leg of our threefold approach. And isn't this true? In your lives, when were the times that you got to know God most intimately or felt the most dependent on him, or felt his presence the closest? Is it not during times of trial and tragedy and pain or illness? He says in chapter 42, I admit it, I was the one, I babbled on about things far beyond me, made small talk about wonders that were way over my head. I admit I once lived by rumors of you. Now I have it all firsthand from my own eyes and ears. I'm sorry, forgive me. I'll never do that again, I promise. I'll never live again on the crusts of hearsay or on the crumbs of rumor. Don't you want to experience that kind of growth? Go ahead, Sonny. I lost a granddaughter last week, oh. Papua New Guinea. And um, the only place that I could go is to God. Yeah. <laughs> place to get the comfort. You know, of course, friends and yeah, and the outpouring of friends was amazing, and uh, it really was. And don't you wonder how non-believers yeah. survive or cope with what happens in this world? Yeah. 
I, I don't, I honestly don't, I can't fathom it. I don't know how they get through it. But I want to experience the kind of growth that Job experienced. Don't you want to have such a mature character and be so settled into the truth that God would call you out to be watched? That he would enter you into evidence as exhibit A in his trial? I'll take a Z. <laughs> you want to be Z, yeah. Don't make me first. <laughs> so when God says, consider my servant Russell, or consider my servant Linda, Consider my servant, Teresa. And then regardless of what this world throws at us, we glorify God by revealing his character, his methods, his principles of unselfish love. That is how our stories can have the ultimate happy ending. It's not about the money. It's not about the livestock or the property or even the children. The only restoration I believe that matters here on this earth is the restoration of our hearts and our characters back to their original design. Job's story has a happy ending because he accurately revealed God's character and his law of love. And even if nothing we have lost in this life gets restored while we're here, we can still live happily ever after. So there's a quote in Wednesday's lesson from Patriarchs and Prophets, but I think it fits better here. The great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. All that was lost by sin is restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed and to be the eternal abode of the obedient. For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. Now God's original purpose in its creation is accomplished. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. That's the real happily ever after. So let's look at Wednesday's lesson. It's entitled, The Final Kingdom. The lesson points out that the Bible is not only a book about history, historical events, but it also points us, obviously, to the future, to end of time, end time events. And it teaches that at the end of time, God's eternal kingdom will be established. It will exist forever, and it will be the eternal home of the redeemed. Unlike worldly kingdoms that have come and gone, this one is everlasting. Do we have any thoughts about that? And do we think this is really what the Bible teaches about God's kingdom? It actually says that it begins now. His kingdom is within you as soon as you open your heart to him. You have the beginnings of um, that relationship. But I, I want to point out, too, yeah. that in Job 29, uh, 4, this is before any of this happened to Job. He said, oh, for the, the days when I was in my prime, when God's intimate friendship blessed my house. So it wasn't just a, he wasn't just suddenly beset upon and then showed his true nature. He had an intimate friendship with God. He had to have. That yeah. Friendship. And I think he had to have in order for God to diagnose him as accurately as he did and in order for him to stand fast through what the onslaught. So yeah, his character already had to be very mature and very settled into the truth about what he knew about God. But when we're going to read a quote, we never get there. Throughout eternity, we're going to be studying and further growing and further maturing our characters. So, but this th is a hint of how that happens. Yes. Through intimate friendship with God. I love that. You know, and that's when we're looking ahead at what our future is. That's the path is intimate yes. friendship with God. Well said. And also, I'm pretty sure Linda may have some insight into my notes because I had the same thoughts about what is really being taught about the kingdom of God. And do we really have to wait until the end of time for God's eternal kingdom to be established? Is it only eternal going forward? Or if his kingdom is truly eternal, has it always been? 
So I have a couple of texts that maybe support this thought. The Lord's Prayer instructs us to pray for his kingdom to come to us here on earth. Jesus repeatedly preached and taught, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand or has come near. He said the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like little children. According to Mark, he told a crowd, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Mark 9.1, he told the Pharisees, I drive off demons by the power of God, and this is evidence that God's kingdom of love has arrived. When asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst or is within you. So what do you think? We may not get the new Jerusalem, the literal new Jerusalem kingdom until the end of time. But I'm not sure that we need to wait until that time to participate in or experience his kingdom of love here and now. So I had a, another thought here that probably was not in your quarterlies. This was, I found in the teacher's edition of the quarterly. I was kind of surprised um, that this was brought up, and I think it's meaningful. I'm not sure that they would draw the same conclusions as we do in this class, but I still think it was meaningful. So it talks about, if you know that we've studied kind of the new interpretation of the third angel's message and how really critically important it is for us to be called back to worship the creator and the designer, I believe for the reason that getting to know God as the creator and designer is key in us determining that he does not run his universe like men or human leaders run their kingdoms or their universes and that his laws don't operate like imposed laws or men's laws. And like I said, I think that's critical to actually getting to know who God is and understanding what his law is and what his law of love is about and how he operates. And so <clears throat> the quarterly brought to light the fact or the number of times that Job referred to creation or what he had learned in nature in the, in the final chapters. Concluding chapters in the book of Job draw on images of creation and nature, which we're told attributes of God can be seen in all that he has made. So I know this was contributing to his intimate relationship with God and what he knew to be true about God. Without answering Job's question as to the why of his suffering, God is portrayed as lovingly yet majestically ruling over his creation. Thus, eventually Job must acknowledge God as his creator. This recognition catalyzes the big change or renewal that takes place in Job's heart. Why do we think that is? Has anybody else had a change and a renewal in their heart after learning the concepts of design law? I know I have. It's, I think it's changed everything. Point of view, perspective, how I see God how I see interactions with other people. It actually makes you go back to your beginnings and, and want to rebuild in a, from the point of creation. Yes, the, the way we were intended. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. So, Job refers to understanding, knowledge, and counsel five times indicating that he has come to a deeper understanding of who God is and how he relates to his creation. Could it be that in coming to know God as the creator and designer, Job was able to determine that his design laws work differently than man's laws, and this knowledge led to a deeper understanding of who God is and a big change in his heart and mind? I thought that that was important that the quarterly brought that out. Like I said, maybe not with the same conclusions, but yes. I have a, a thought, and I, I've been listening, and I agree that Job was one of the most upright men in the Bible. But I think that the three friends, when they came to him, chapter 2, it says they, they sat on the ground for seven days and 
seven nights. Nobody said anything. Right. And Job was the first one to speak, it's beginning of chapter three. And Job wanted to curse the day that he that he was born. <laughs> he was wondering why he even lived and went through right. all of this. And then the first friends started speaking. I think after hearing them criticize him and hearing this, that's what built up his character more in God. Oh, I agree. At first he had he had doubts. I believe he had doubts at first as to why, like it was mentioned before, he's questioning God, yeah. why did you take all this away from me? Yeah. I should have never been born. And then those three friends that criticized him, even though they meant it for bad, Job knew the end. I, right. mean, I believe he had a glimpse of Romans 8.28, all things working together. I agree. And those friends only instilled what they were trying to take away from him. Mm-hmm. Satan could have sent them friends, mm-hmm. all friends. Oh, no doubt about it. He sent those friends to try to persuade Job to curse God and die. Yeah. But instead, he only built up Job's character more. Mm-hmm. Right, so I think that's very good. More determined. Determined. Yeah. And I, I mean, I agree with you. I, we don't have anywhere in here that he never had doubts. He for sure wondered why in the world is all this happening to me. But I think you're right. I think that he was so settled into who he knew God was that when he heard his friend's accusations, he knew that wasn't it. He defended God. That's right. They were speaking wrong of the God he knew. And I think that in the ten picture, he realized that it was all about God, not about him. I totally agree. Although, I, let me just throw in a couple of texts out of Job 23, 10. Here's Job in the midst of all this. Mm-hmm. He knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. So he, he knew there was that this was a refining process. Exactly. One. And then in Job uh, 19, uh, verse, starting with verse 25, here he says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. So he, he had a, a eye towards the future. He understood that whatever, you know, he thought God was causing it. <laughs> right. This was a trial. This was a refining process. And the end result, he already understood there was a Savior. There was a resurrection. Yeah. There was eternal life. And he was trying to focus on that goal, even though it obviously he got in periods of discouragement. Sure. This is right during his period of discouragement where he <clears throat> conveyed that he understood the process was going to help him. Right. And that he was preparing him for the good that was lying ahead. And is it, to me, that is an incredible level of insight when you think about what he had to work with. We're talking about before even the books of Moses. You know what I mean? So that whatever light we have been giving, there was none of that. There was literally nature and his communion and intimate friendship with God that gave him the insight into these things. Yeah. To me, that's incredible. Stories told down to the generations Correct. about yeah. creation and the fall, et cetera, et cetera. And the flood, yeah. yeah. Right. There was no written record. Have you, have you guys ever wondered what would have happened if Job had cursed God? Well, what would God have done? I mean, think about it. Well, what would he have done? Have, has there ever been a time in history where God was cursed and spit upon and nailed to yes. the cross? Okay, uh, God wouldn't have behaved any differently. And he would have healed him and restored him. <laughs> he would have attempted to heal him if Job's heart was, was uh, open to that. Right. I think the universe, the onlooking universe, the, the unfallen hosts, weren't ready for that, that much of a revelation of God's character at that time. So he picked, he picked Job out knowing that it wouldn't happen. God wouldn't have behaved any differently. God wasn't the one bringing this mess on him. And to me, just like throughout the rest of the Old Testament, he was willing to risk being misunderstood and being given credit for all of the nastiness because he wanted one God. He wanted the one God perspective. Even if it's all good and all bad, he would rather not have their loyalty split. Yes. One of the huge problems with um, 
other religions or philosophies is that they leave you with a sense of futility. <laughs> that this is all there is. All there is. And don't expect more. And if you really want to get in tune with what's happening, you know, in the present, then you need to go to this, um, this idea that we are basically nothing. You know, the Tao. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the, the root of the Tao philosophy. And, um, you know, for someone to understand as much as, for anyone rather, to understand as much as we do about creation and still come to the, to the idea that there's, that it all returns to futility is a very, very um, non-intellectual and non-thinking thought. It's, it's a closed perspective, yeah, for sure. It, yeah. And to me, I'm really glad that it's not all about us. To me, that's liberating and freeing. That we have a role, but we're not the stars. Yes, we have an online comment. Uh, could it be that God refines even those who already reflect his character uh, so that they might reflect him more purely? It's absolutely that. We're, we're going to, okay, perfect segue. We're going to talk about, I mean, if we are saved, we go to heaven, by definition, we will have characters that accurately reflect God, that we will have Christ-like characters, and we'll then spend eternity, which is a really long time, <laughs> further growing, further having our characters refined, further learning more about redemption, about God's plan, forever. No <clears throat> yeah. So for sure, and I, I do think that the whole time we're here, that's God's goal. He wants that for us to always constantly be further refining and maturing and growing our character because we are his witnesses. That makes us good ambassadors or representatives of who he really is and what he can do in the lives of others. It's kind of interesting that, you know, in Eden, one of the first things that occurred is everybody blamed each other. It's <laughs> you know, Yeah. It's her fault. Um, God. Right. And God. Potentially. And yet, when God was sort of put on trial like this, he didn't blame anybody. Nope. And I think there's something to be said in our maturing, where it is tempting to say, I did this because mm -hmm. I was treated Justify, way, rationalize, yeah. I treated me badly, or because I have bad baggage, uh, whatever. <laughs> but I think there's a, there's a statement, I mean, there's a, a feeling for the need for ownership yes. of your own activities totally without blame yes you know your parents had baggage they passed it to you yada yada but at some point you have to say whatever i am i am whatever cause it cause it but i i have ownership now right. of what i'm going to do with the baggage that was handed to me you know come to god and shore up those weaknesses yeah. and stop blaming everybody around you for everything that you do take responsibility you know i, I think there's something to be said for uh <coughs> recognizing blaming of mm -hmm. everyone as a way of kind of trying to keep that refining process from happening right you you need to get rid of that and just focus on what God can do to, to restore you to what you should have been like without sin that's God's goal yeah to make you the you you would have been without sin absolutely yeah. yeah and I mean I do I think we saw that in Job because he was accurately reflecting God's character we see it in God and we see just the opposite in the friends and the wife. They want, they blame was immediate. There has to be someone to blame. Because this stuff wouldn't just happen. And Job doesn't mention a new wife that I'm aware of. No, that was, that it wasn't a new wife. Mentioned the new wife or whatever you were reading earlier on. And then no, she stayed. <laughs> so she must have, I always wonder what happened with her after she, you know, she produced all of these new children. Right all the old children that's a lot of children it's a lot of children well and i have to i don't know i can't help but think that her that her heart was changed that her character was was matured and grown by watching what she saw in her husband and what she saw in the restoration process that proved he was absolutely right about who he said god was you know what i'm saying hmm? 
lost children too. Exactly. You know, she, lost she lost 10 lost. babies. So I can't imagine. Right. I can't imagine her not thinking, will you just curse God so this will stop? Exactly. Make it stop. You know what I mean? So totally agree. Well, you know, I was just, uh, the thought just occurred to me that when you, when things are happening at such a rapid pace to you and they're so intense, cursing God is like, that's your last effort to make something happen. Right. You know, Get his attention. Anything. Yeah. Just anything. Make it happen. And and so I, I kind of give her that as a as an you know a good excuse for being a human being. You know what I mean? You, you just want something to change. You want it to. Right. Well, and like she said, what she was going through had to be excruciating. Those of you that are married, would you like to watch your spouse? First of all, would you, you lose ten of your own children, and then you watch your spouse be stricken? head to toe, near death, suffering. This was excruciating. It makes perfect sense why she would, like I said, wanted to make it stop, however. All right, so we're at an awkward time. Yes. A sister that lost three out of four. What a horror that must have been. We did. We talked about. And I'm sure she felt like Jim. My mom and I talked about, in fact, I don't know that we have enough time to, to do Thursday's lesson, but do, don't you all know people? Like I said at the beginning, we characterize people's patience as the patience of Job. But don't you all know somebody that seems to be like Job and just seems to be singled out for a disproportionate uh, portion of tragedy or death or illness or something? And it just keeps coming. And you wonder how in the world does this person survive not in a padded room or something? So we have a... a an aunt, one of my mother's sisters, that is the closest thing I know to Job. So she lived, I think, just short of 92 Two. years. And in that 92 years, she had four children. The, the first, she had three girls and one boy. The boy had some trouble with alcohol and possibly uh, some other substances and hit a little girl in his car, and she died. And before the son could go on trial for the vehicular incident, he had a stroke and he died. So she buried the one son. Then one of her daughters had a son. So this was her grandson, just short of 15. He got hit on a bicycle. He died, so she buried a grandchild. Then her daughter, the mother of that grandchild, dropped dead on the floor of a brain aneurysm several years later, so she buried that child. Then the third daughter, or sorry, another daughter, also had some trouble with alcohol and substances uh, and drove a car into a tree and she died and so she buried that daughter. So for sure some of this was self-inflicted. I'm not saying that, uh, that she was cursed, but when you start to see this stuff pile up, you think, what in the world? And she was always pleasant, always had a smile on her face, treated my mother exceptionally well, was basically a second mother to my mom. Like I said, strong. One of the daughters would go away for years at a time and they wouldn't hear from her and she had two children that she left with Lucille to raise, so she raised two grandchildren. Anyway, so she was an amazing woman. Think about how, <clears throat> think about how much more empathy these people will have for God. Exactly, and uh, what he went through. Job will empathize with God better than I will. I mean, having never so never had children and hopefully never losing one, um, you know, to lose ten, you can he'll be able to put his arms around God. Say, you know what? I I had a taste of it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. I think we're out of time. Thank you for active and awesome participation. Let's bow our heads. Father, we know that you are here with us today. We thank you for that. We thank you for your repeated uh, demonstration and evidence that you are not like Satan accuses you of being. And we want to now and throughout eternity just continue to find out more and more about your character of love and uh, your efforts to restore and redeem us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.